at this time, it is truly a distinct honor uh, for us here at the Pentecostals of Mandeville, for myself as pastor, uh, for the first time in the service uh, that I'm aware of, to have our presbyter over Section 12, Reverend Donald Bryan. Uh, he pastors in Slidell. He's been there for many, many, many years, serving faithfully, heavily involved in the community, in this parish. And uh, I remember Brother Brian way back to when I began my spiritual journey. And uh, I can remember my night of ordination. And he was there as well as one of the presbyters that sit over our state and oversee the affairs of the ministry in the Louisiana district. And uh, being a part of that special night uh, in our lives and as we have journeyed through the licensing process. Those of you that are licensed ministers, you will remember Brother Brian. He has sat on the Louisiana district board for many, many years. He is highly, highly um, respected and revered and serves this district again and his local assembly and community with such incredible, incredible just excellence and uh, I'm very honored tonight we're doing something different uh, we did not have a district conference because of all that is happening and so what the district has decided to do those that are getting ordained they have commissioned that at the local level so brother Brian is here on behalf of the Louisiana district and we're going to now go into what will be an ordination service this has never happened before I don't think for our district certainly not here at the POM many of you probably if this would have happened would not to get, uh, not have the op opportunity to witness an ordination, but just enjoy the service, and then we're going to hear some great preaching tonight. Would you help me welcome our presbyter, Reverend Donald Bryan. Thank you. All right, God bless you. You may be seated, and we welcome you tonight as Brother Pentecost is so well said. We're making history here at the Pentecostals of Mandeville. Tonight we're here to celebrate an ordination service. This event occurs annually at our district level, as Brother Pentecost again said, at our district conference. So, delight to be here tonight. I give honor to Brother and Sister Pentecost, wonderful pastor of this congregation, and the beautiful congregation that's here at, Pen at the Pentecostals of Mandeville. Thank you. And thank you for not only being part of this church, but being here tonight. Amen. Tonight is a very special night in the life of Brother Sister Myers. And so on behalf of, of this church and to all of the ministers that are here, God bless you for that. We welcome you. It's good to have the colonel here. It's good to have all of Brother Sister Myers' friends that are here, not just church family, but community friends that are here. We welcome you as well. Because, again, what we do tonight is an ordination service and a recognition of the call of God upon a man and a woman's life. In this particular case, Brother Bowers. And so we welcome you. Brother Trinicoff said it already. We normally do this ordination at district conference. This was scheduled in March. Anybody remember what happened in March? And uh, all of our plans got blown apart. And so we scheduled our rescheduled our district conference to July. Will anybody remember what we were still in in July? So our district board scheduled the conference for August. And then, anybody remember what we were still in in August? We had COVID plus hurricanes. So uh, all of our conference plans got moved. And so, again, it's been said, what we decided to do, we'd move these ordination to the local level and get these men and women uh, commissioned and ordained for the gospel. Amen. And uh, so a delight again to be here tonight. A preacher is the nexus between a man's soul and eternity. And what stands between my soul and your soul in eternity is a man of God. And God has commissioned and done something very unique, and that is taking a perfect gospel and put it in the hands of imperfect men. Men and women, but tonight a man who has been called or felt that God has commissioned him to preach the gospel. And so I'd like for Brother and Sister Byers to come, if you don't mind, uh, Brother Byers, and stand up here with me as we begin this service. And the, the charge that I give tonight is going to be encapsulated in three or two parts. And that is the ordination charge as a minister of the gospel, and the second of the laying on of hands. A preacher is a gift from God. 
And Paul writes to us, and there are many admonitions in the Scripture, but particularly in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul is charging here young Timothy to do several things as a minister of the gospel. But he says these words, I charge thee, but therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing as a kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, repute, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then they, he talks about the people of the last days. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work and avengers, make full proof of thy ministry. So Paul's first charge, Brother Byers, was to preach the word of God. Ministers, and particularly pastors, have a lot of hats that we wear. We're everything from administrators to janitors to uh, the ones that keep the bills paid and all of that. But our challenge for all Britain and our commission is to preach the word of God. God didn't leave this to angels. He gave it to men. Men that are sensitive to the call of God. So again, that nexus or that intersection between my soul and eternity is a man. A man that will preach the word of God. Not just a talk, but the anointed word of God. And he said then to be instant, in season, out of season. But my commission is the preaching of the word. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God chose to save them through the foolishness of preaching to them that believe and not foolish preaching but the foolishness of preaching and we've all, we've all heard a lot of foolish preaching but God said it wasn't that it was the foolishness of it what does that mean brother Byers that means the simple the idea that an imperfect man could take the words from heaven as he has been anointed by God to speak and that would become an eternal salvation and destiny for the lives of people and so as I look at this congregation and I look at those that you will reach as you would go to Thailand, if I understand, and those souls that are waiting even now as we serve, have service tonight, they are waiting to hear the gospel. There's only one thing. I must be saved, and I'm saved through the word of God. And so on behalf of our district superintendent, Brother Kevin Cox, our district secretary, Brother Randy Harper, and our district board, of 17 presbyters or 15 presbyters plus these two men. We're delighted tonight to recognize the call of God upon Brother and Sister Byers life, Brother Byers life. And so, Brother Byers, I want to read this ordination charge to you. And um, this is the charge that we give to all of our ministers. And I've already quoted it. It's found in Timothy 4 and 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And so our charge tonight as a district, and you have reached the highest level of ministry or licensure in the ministry of the United Pentecostal Church. Most of you know our first level is local license. And many of you men perhaps have local license. And then it's general license and then ordination. Ordination is a recognition that this man is truly called from God. And so the charge is to make full proof of your ministry. So the question is not now, is he called of God? We recognize that tonight with his ordination. So on behalf of our district board, Brother Byers, I want to leave this charge with you, and that is your commission as a minister of the gospel, not an ordained minister of the United Pentecostal Church. And th those souls that await to hear your word, uh, use this gift that God has given to you. When Jesus was about to be crucified, one of his last acts was an act of servanthood. The Bible said at the Last Supper when he was there, he arose, he took a towel, and he began to wash the feet of those disciples. And so the symbol of the ministry is not a sword. It's not a spear. It's a towel. Because we are servants 
of God. I got something in the email the other day, and I move along, but this man was sending some email about some stuff. It was a so-called preacher. It wasn't one of ours, but he had all these titles behind him. And I wrote him back. I normally don't respond to those, Brother Trinicost, but I said, you need to drop all those pretentious titles. And I don't normally respond like that. But because the Bible said we're just simply servants of God. And so behalf of, again, our district, Brother Trinicost, I'd like for you to come and present to Brother Byers the symbol of his servanthood as a minister of the gospel. I present this towel to this man. And lastly, as evidence of what we've done tonight, uh, Brother Byers, I have your certificate of ordination and your fellowship card. You probably have one of those in your wallet for general license, but now uh, you will be an ordained minister of the gospel. And again, on behalf of our district, welcome to the fellowship as an ordained minister. And I think that uh, the thing that makes ordination unique and different there's two aspects and I close with this it's the ordination charge that we've given to brother and sister Byers but it's also the laying on of hands and the scripture teaches us this and there, I believe there's something unique and very anointed and very spiritual that's imparted when the presbytery lays hands upon this ordinate and so I'd like for you to stand tonight and I'd like for ordained ministers that are here if you would come, the ordained ministers, we're going to lay hands on brother and sister Byers. We're going to send them forth in faith and the gospel. And if you're an ordained minister this, tonight, I want you to come and join me as we pray for this couple. Uh, we all love them. We've seen the evidence of the ministry in their life, the call of God. But again, tonight's a recognition that God has done something marvelous through this ordination. So let's pray right now. Would you join with me? Thank you, Father. God, we're thankful tonight for your grace and your spirit. Lord, as we stand tonight in agreement, Lord, with your call upon this job, God, we pray as we lay hands on our spirit, Lord, God, that you would anoint the brother of lives. Thank you for the call that is most of their lives. God, I pray right now, Lord, that your spirit will rest in the Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. God bless brother and sister Bowers. They are ordained before God. Amen.
together and seal that promise in your heart. Seal that promise in your heart. Amen. You can make your way to your seats and we can be seated this evening. We are very honored this evening to have a wonderful and
incredible man of God with us, Reverend Greg Albritton, all the way from Alexandria, Louisiana. Amen. He's no stranger here to the Pentecostals of Mandeville. We love him dearly. He is the father of three beautiful children, an incredible man of God, an evangelist that just happens to be here tonight as he was integral in teaching the Byers Bible study. And since he made his way all the way down from Alexandria, we have been trying to get connected anyway, but we're so honored to have him back in this pulpit, back at the POM. Let's welcome for the Greg Albrecht. Thank you, Pastor Trinicost. Good evening and praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to a wonderful Wednesday night. I'm sure glad to be in a church on Wednesday night that acts like it might even be Sunday. Amen. Amen. I love, I love interacting with the presence of the Lord. This is, this is the meeting place. This is where we come to connect with our with our Jesus and I you know I love going to church we like to quote the verse I was glad when they said unto me let us go to the house of the Lord but you know something I've come to the conclusion we're not the only ones like going to church because I, I, I Jesus is here every time I go he likes going to church <laughs> and we get to interact and we get to have communion with Jesus amen so thank you to the leaders and the praise and worship team leading us in the presence of the Lord. What an honor to be with the Pentecostals of Mandeville tonight. Distinguished guests. I know Brother Byers told me he has several guests in the house tonight. We welcome all of you. Welcome all of you and, and those of you, as, as Pastor said, this is your home church and those that are guests, just such such an honor and uh, to be with friends and, and wonderful people. To be with Brother Brian, let me tell you, when, when Pastor Trinicoff said Brother Brian pastors a great church in Slidell, he wasn't kidding. I've been privileged to be a guest minister there several times. We always have good church, and I love, love the work of the Lord that's taking place in Slidell. Amen. Honored to be with my dear friends, Paul and Melinda Trinicoff. Amen. Amen. To walk in and see them both healthy. It's my first time to see them in the last little while. Oh, I'm so excited about that. Amen. Amen. And uh, speaking of being healthy, if I wore what I wanted to tonight, it wouldn't be this churchy outfit. It would be a Superman t-shirt because I am a COVID survivor as of the last three weeks. Amen. Amen. The very serious and heavy as it's hit so so many across the country and the world, but so grateful, grateful that uh, God allowed our our case to be a fairly mild case. It's still a rough go. Don't 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 doubt it. But uh, thankful to come through that and come out the backside. I I know it was Jesus and help, but I just well, I need a Superman T-shirt. Amen. I, Thankful and to be with Greg and Nikki Byers tonight. One of the greatest honors of my life, and I thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. Greg and Nikki got baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost on either their first or second visit back when I was assisting out in Lee Road. They got the Holy Ghost, got baptized. And it was my assignment. Won't you connect with this couple, disciple them, teach them a Bible study. And so we set that up. And I don't remember if we made it through one Bible study with just us. Because who they are showed up immediately. Immediately. Because I remember them saying, we have a friend and, and we would love for her to be a part of the Bible study. Is Sharif Fitzmaurice in the, in the room? She's next door with the children. Sharif came. Loved it. 
gentleman named Richard came, loved it. They would not even be discipled by themselves. They were already discipling others. And I'd like, I'm trying to get this across to you. And he's saying, did you get this? Did y'all get And And he showed his heart for souls. And she showed her heart for souls. On their first weeks as baby Christians, they brought people with them. Amen. Amen. And Cherie has married in the church, as you well know, her family, uh, living for the Lord. Richard in eternity. Thank you all. Thank you all from your first weeks in, the, in serving the Lord, showing it's not just about us. It's about others, and it's about souls, and it's about disciple, and it's about leading, helping leading people in growth in their walk with God. Amen. And now being ordained, Thailand appointed as missionaries. What an incredible journey. Amen. What an incredible journey. Amen. I love you too. And I'm honored to be here tonight. Let's look in the word of the Lord to Isaiah chapter 53. I want to look at verses 3 through 5 of Isaiah 53. Again, to all of our guests, thank you, those that come tonight to honor the buyers, all of you. Thank you for being here. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 through 5, but I want to say something before I read these verses. Brother Brian stood here and made a statement that God has called ministry to be the nexus between humanity and eternity. I thank the Lord for Google. I hurried up and Googled Nexus. I wasn't texting. I was trying to learn. I know what Lexus is, but I didn't. And he said it is. It is a connection linking two or more things. And he was specifically saying it to the ministry, and we are going to focus on ministry tonight. And yet I want to say it's to all of us from the moment we're born again into the kingdom of God, we become a link from heaven, anointing and healing oil to someone with a need and someone with a hurt. Amen. So please remember that as I minister what God has put on our heart for tonight. Isaiah 53, 3 through 5, prophecy speaking of Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid it as it were our faces from him and we esteemed him not. Now please notice these next two verses. Surely he has borne or carried our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse five, but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace or one version says the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him do you notice all the statements of what he took on or went through so that you and I could have joy, peace, and healing and salvation. He did it just for us. I want to minister tonight on this subject, and you won't be able to make the connection from the text at all, but I believe we will through the message. But I minister, I want to minister tonight on the subject, the Panama Canal effect. Would you say that with me? The Panama Canal effect. God bless, and you may be seated. Lord, your word is already anointed and you're in this house. But your word and your spirit work together to be so powerful. So I'm asking over the next few moments, let your word and your spirit work and 
have their perfect work in this room tonight. The Panama Canal is a man-made waterway constructed on the isthmus of Panama. You might not have thought you were going to hear the word nexus tonight. I doubt you thought you would hear the word isthmus. It's kind of hard to say. It even gets better than that. An isthmus is a narrow strip of land, narrow strip of land with sea on every side, but it also forms a link between two larger areas of land, so a larger area of land, larger area of land, little strip that has water on either side is called an isthmus. But here's where it gets better than that, because the plural of isthmus is isthmuses. You didn't think you were going to hear that word tonight. Isthmuses are considered locations of great strategic value. The United States and Great Britain and other countries had discussions as far back as the 1700s and into the 1800s of the possibility of creating a waterway somewhere that would connect the Atlantic side to the Pacific side of our country. And we'll look at that in a moment. In 1881, France began work on the canal in Panama. But due to engineering problems, extreme problems and challenges, and high worker mortality rate, the work was stopped. High worker mortality rate, it is said during France's time where they spent in the 1800s, I believe it was $285 million trying to get this construction project started. Over 20,000 lives were lost. Snakes, spiders, mosquitoes. If you know my history, you know I would be interested in the mosquito aspect. So many lives lost. Early 1900s, the United States bought in, paid off France, purchased the opportunity from Panama, a newly formed country. You go back and study, it's a very interesting journey. The United States took over the project in 1904, and the canal was opened 10 years later in 1914. It was one of the largest and most difficult engineering projects ever undertaken. The American Society of Civil Engineers has ranked the Panama Canal as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. You see the waters on either side of this narrow isthmus are 86, it's 86 feet difference in elevation that has to be accounted for. Uh, the waters are not that different, but because they chose to have a lake in the middle, of a reservoir that's higher elevation, the ships had to be lifted. So on the Atlantic side, there are locks and dams that lift these ships. All that had to be built. Then the world's largest dam at the time created the world's largest reservoir that consisted of some of the middle part of the journey, 50 miles in all, 40 land miles, and then several miles into the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, carved out so that the ships have enough depth to travel through this journey. And, um, and so the United States dove in and began to build. If we can put, there it is, thank you, the, the, the map there, you can... See on the little, the, the, the close-up here that's pulled out, um, you can see the, the traverse that's taking place. You can see the large lake in the middle of the orange area. That's the, the reservoir that was created. On the Atlantic side, as I mentioned, uh, locks and dams that elevate the ships, and then they cross the reservoir. Then they have to go through locks and dams that then lower them back down. And you see the little spot that has the little square, the little red square, that's where the 50 mile section is located. And, and so it's not just a straight canal, it's, it's, it's a major journey. And, and, and so, very interesting. The maximum boat length 
is 1,200 feet, 9 inches. I was impressed by the specific. I mean, 9 inches. Not an inch more. You go study it, it's amazing. You see monster ships where there looks like there's an inch to spare on either side. They're connected. A different captain comes on board and helps guide, and they're connected to some kind of chains or rails where these ships go through these. It takes, once they're approved to cross, it takes 10 hours for the ship to traverse these 50 miles. The boat, a beam, which is something I did not know, but it's, it's the distance from the water level to the highest point on the ship, can be 160 feet and 9 inches, and the maximum depth below, there's a word for it, below the water level, I think it's draft, can be 49 feet 10 inches. So a ship can be roughly 50 feet under the water. It can reach up 160 feet and be 1,200 feet long. And, and, and so in 2008, 40, the, the, the Panama Canal averaged 40 vessels a day. 1,500, nearly 1,500, 14,600 ships crossed that, that canal in 2008. This canal didn't, didn't come cheap. The beginning years of the 1900s, not only what France had invested in the lives lost when the United States took over, um, the cost of that 10-year project in the early 1900s was $375 million. Now let me put that in today's terms. In today's terms, that's just over $10 billion that this project was. And even though the United States took all kind of efforts to protect from snakes, spiders, mosquitoes, and all the fevers, the yellow fever, and the, so, so many sicknesses that were coming, the, the, there were still over 5,000 lives lost. It was the single most expensive construction project in the United States at that time. An incredibly costly undertaking just to build a canal 40 miles. I mean, it's not just one canal, if I've explained, but to build a passageway 40 miles across land and then carved into the ocean in the Caribbean Sea so that ships can cross here. Why such an undertaking? Why would national leaders and world leaders chipping in think it was worth the challenge and the cost? It would benefit and make huge impact on the economies and the commerce of much of the world. So allow me just a moment on the front end of our message tonight to tell you the Panama Canal effect or the results. Why this costly of an undertaking? Why were these 40 to 50 miles so important for our nation, for the world, it is considered, that little stretch is considered one of the two most strategic artificial waterways in the world. Ships sailing, so now let's begin to look at the line, if you'll look at the black line, the longer line. Ships sailing from the United States East Coast, think New York, Traveling to San Francisco, West Coast, those ships had to travel all the way, not only through Central America, but then South America, and circle the tip of Cape Horn, Chile. That journey would be 12,000 miles. That journey would be about a year long. I know you're just looking at a little black line, but that was a long, long journey. And so when this canal was completed at great expense, at great expense, now when a ship gets to that location, hear me, 
instead of it when when a ship gets to the Panama Canal instead of having five months to get where they would be on the other side and 8,000 extra miles now in eight to ten hours they're on the other side somebody say five months saved saved. 8,000 miles saved because a channel was carved that somebody thought the price was worth paying You say, why are you crying about the Panama Canal? Because I know where I'm going. Somebody thought the price was worth paying. Somebody thought the effort was worth it. So that in the future, ships could make this journey. So you multiply 8,000 miles per ship, five months travel time times 15,000 ships. Do the math. You say, well, that's, how, that, that's just saving a little time. Have you imagined how much it would cost to have a crew for an extra? How much food, how much fuel? Now, something happened in my study This was a huge boost to the world trade, the world economy, commerce. But I found something, and and, and the preachers in the house will know, sometimes when you have an imagery or an an analogy, sometimes there's just one point that blows your analogy up and you can't stand it because you're like, that was going to be a good sermon. (laughs) But when I read that the largest, and it's, and it's, it's increased so much in the last few years, but the largest ships have to pay up to $450,000 for one crossing. I'm like, oh, no, that blows. That just blows a good good example, right? I mean, what, what, how can that fit in? And then the more I got to thinking about it, that $450,000 seems like a great cost, but it's saving them millions. Brother Bonvillian, Brother Marty, if I can say Brother Marty, if you would calculate how long, how much fuel alone, and again, your crew and your the time, like in the five months, you can go back and get another load and go back again, and you're getting a payoff. So then the thought hit me. It still, cross, it still costs every ship dearly to cross. But because of the cost that was made years ago, there is even the opportunity to cross there. And there is the opportunity to not be aimlessly focused going around the tip of Cape Horn. If I can leave the Panama Canal there for just a moment, I would like to go on a biblical journey for a few minutes that shares a similar story and shows the incredible impact that one passageway can make. I just want to take a few moments and show you how, how powerful. Remember, our, our, our esteemed elder talked about that we are the nexus. We're the connect point between humanity and eternity. They, they're traveling on a journey, and God has a method that he uses to help people find the way. So we're going to talk about Jesus for a little bit, and the pain and suffering that he went through that created a path for humanity. But before we get to Jesus, let's back all the way up. Don't get scared. It's going to be a very quick Bible study. But we're going all the way back to Genesis. And I know you're calculating how far is it from Genesis to Jesus. Oh, no. So hang on. This one's going to be quick. Let me slow down and make you nervous. Genesis. Stay with me. And I feel such anointing in this house. I don't feel like I have to holler tonight. I don't have to jump. Amen. There's such a peace. There's a purity of God's presence. But in the beginning, God created the Garden of Eden, paradise. 
God created humanity and he placed humanity in this garden. We get the picture from the early chapters of Genesis. God met with Adam and Eve there. We talked about God meets with us in church. God met with them in the garden. That's what made it paradise. It was unhindered communion. It was perfect relationship. You have the picture of, of God coming down and walking with Adam and Eve and talking with Adam and Eve and then they fell and succumbed to temptation and fell to sin and they hid because sin always brings separation from God and humanity. It always becomes something that has to be dealt with because now there's a separation and so we we, we see that this perfect communion was broken and paradise was lost and Adam and Eve left the garden and there was an angel with a flaming sword placed to guard the tree of life, which is so interesting to me, the imagery of the tree of life that we find again in Revelation in heaven. Why did the tree of life have to be guarded? Because now they had sin. If they eat the tree of life, now sin can live forever, and God has already envisioned a heaven that has no sin, and sin can't live forever. So you don't have that. He wasn't being mean to Adam and Eve. He was saying what's entered now, it, it has to be dealt with. It cannot live forever. So there's an angel, a, a seraphim with a flaming sword saying, sorry, this is off limits. That intimacy you had with God, now it's going to be a process for that to happen again. So you walk through the Bible. We're already in the middle of the Old Testament. You walk through the Bible. You walk through the Bible and now God begins to unfold plans. And it's so many details and so many instructions. If you want to get close to me or near to me, there are sacrifices involved. There's commitments involved. And there's, there's the priest will take all of that. Why? So you can get close to what was in the garden already, but it was lost. And it's as if God's saying that this is not just easy as you think. All right. So in the Old Testament. We have, if you've been through Bible studies, you've heard it, we call it the tabernacle plan and then later the temple. But it was God's meeting place with humanity. When the tribes of Israel camped, and, and you can see the tents in, in the picture here, all the tribes were on either side. This, this tent of meeting, this place that they set up everywhere they went was in the middle of the camp. It had a it had a opening the the gate on one end and then you had the outer courts and then you see inside the wall or the fenced area is is the place that was called the the tent of meeting and inside of there uh, was two rooms inside of that tent was two rooms the the priests always every day they operated out here and every day they even operated in the first room which we call the holy place. Every day the priest had, they had to make sure the candles were burning right, make sure this was happening, make sure that was happening. But between, if we can go to that next picture, between, and this is a kind of a cutaway picture if you just look for a moment, this would be the inside of that, that tent we just looked at. The, the first room where you see the candlestick and the table of showbread and the altar of incense, Those, the priest went every day, but you see, and they kind of have it cut out so you can see past it, but there is a veil. I say a veil. There's a veil in front of the second room, which is called the holiest of holies or the most holy place. And, and, and that veil, please, please understand, it wasn't a sheer curtain like, like I have hanging in my house that you can kind of see through. It wasn't two layers like the thicker curtains that are in some of the rooms of the house that, that, that are the material and then the, the lining. No, 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 no. That's, that's not what this veil was. The veil separated the holy place from the holiest of holies. There were figures, find this interesting, of cherubims embroidered into this curtain. Remember, the cherubim guarded the tree of life. It's almost as if God's saying, y'all can serve me and come close. You can come near. But this place is off limits. The angels are still saying sin has to be fully dealt with before you get to go back here. 
the priest only went once a year and he had so the high priest and he had so many restrictions you read through all the things he had to do and there was no opening now this one has it it's cut out but there was no opening the priest didn't have a little spot where he slid through he had to go around the side on that one few moment visit a year access was denied to the most intimate holy pure powerful presence of God. The, I find this interesting. Now it's going to the temple, not to the mobile tabernacle, but to the temple that Solomon built. But the Jerusalem temple replica, people that tried to replicate the temple, the curtain that was the veil it was 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. There was no access. Essentially, essentially, it was shielding a holy God from sinful humanity because God's holiness and humanity's sinfulness could not coincide. And yet, when our Jesus, when our Jesus came on the scene, God manifests in the flesh, human. 100% human. He wasn't a half, he wasn't 50% human and 50% God. He was 100% human and 100% God. And when Jesus came on this earth, let's just leave that picture up for a moment, but Hebrews starts describing to us what happened. And I move quickly, but in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6 through 8, Listen what the Bible's telling us. Or you can put the scripture on the screen. That would probably be better. These, the priests, it says in verse 6, they always went into the first tabernacle. That's that holy place, that first room. It says, but the second, the priest only went there. We talked about that once a year. And he had to bring blood. And he had to offer it for the people. Why was this so? Verse 8, the Holy Ghost was showing that the way to that last room, the holiest of holies, it wasn't made manifest yet. Now, Jesus is crucified. Jesus dies on the cross. He's the innocent, spotless lamb. But he takes, as we read in our text, he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for us. He was chastised for us. He suffered and he died. And within 50 days after what Jesus went through on the cross, I find this so interesting. In all of human history, the Holy Ghost was poured out 50 days after Jesus was broken on the cross. Amen. In all of history, that was opened up because of what Jesus went through. The church was birthed in Acts chapter 2. Miracles and revivals began to take place because what had it been blocked you got you got to watch this with me. Notice, now let's jump back to Hebrews and see a little bit more what Hebrews is saying. He said, Jesus didn't go behind that veil by the blood of goats and calves. But when he, when he went through that veil, he, he, he went, amen, having, he shed his own blood. He obtained eternal redemption for us. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. I love it, love it, love it. Matthew chapter 27. What happened the very moment Jesus died? Oh, this fires me up. What happened the exact moment Jesus died? The Bible says he cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And when Jesus said, it is finished, oh, the Bible says, <laughs> the veil, the veil of the temple at the moment that his body was broken, at the moment the suffering reached its climax and seemed to do its job uh, from the heavens, a hand came down. I just see it like a karate chop. Uh, I just see it like a, shoo, a hand came from the heavens because the Bible said from the top to the bottom, the veil was rent. And, and, and at that moment where there had been no access, no possibility of you and I getting from there to there. Not since the Garden of Eden. They had been able to be with God, near God, close to God, but not walk beside him in that intimate manner. 
but when Jesus died on the cross. From top to bottom. And it's as he was saying, angels, back up. Move to the side. I know I've had you doing this for a long time now, but now the price for sin has been fully paid. Now... Now his body has been broken. The price has been fully paid. Access, and I, I, I know it's not in the Bible, but I just like to believe the Lord just, just said angels change positions. Instead of doing this, now they're saying, welcome, come on in. He paid the price so you can walk in intimate relationship with your creator. Now let's move a few verses further down in Hebrews chapter 10, describing it even further. Having therefore, brother, boldness to enter where? That may, that's the second room. That's the one that represents all of his provision, all of his power, all of his holiness, all of his, whoo, the, the most intimate place you can get with God is that you can be bold. To do what? To get 50 feet away and say, oh, no, no, no. To enter. Come on, young people. You can have boldness. That's what you did all, all service long. Because now the access is not denied. Amen. A channel has been carved. A journey has been provided. A, a means has been provided. We can have boldness to enter into the holiest. How? By the blood of Jesus. Look at verse 20. By a new. Talking about the Panama Canal effect. That someone was willing to pay a price. I'm talking about the Panama Canal effect. That, that Jesus was willing to pay the greatest price of all. So that you and I could. Mm. You don't have to spend your life aimless on that black line that goes 8,000 extra miles and spend months and years of your life trying to figure it out and find out. No, 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 no. Jesus says access granted. Uh, you can find healing. It's still going to cost you something, but he paid the ultimate price. You can find healing. You can find hope. You can find salvation. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm doing my best. Hebrews 10, verse 20. Back on the screen, if we may. That last verse. By a new and living way, with which he has consecrated for us through the isthmus. Through the veil, that is to say, please say those last two words with me. You mean, I know he's God, but you mean to tell me what he went through here. That was brokenness. That was wounds. That was bruises. It was hurt. That was rejection, agony, and misery to this. Became a channel. So you can be healed. And your life can be put back together. And you can be saved. And you can walk in intimacy. I wish I could sing right now like Tim Pedigo. I'd sing, I can go into the holy of holies. I can go into the presence of the king because his flesh went through something that carved a channel for all of humanity. I put this in my notes. I know it's not super technical, but I just wrote, wow, just wow. Because that's how I feel. He was wounded 
just for me. He was chastised just for me. His brokenness created a channel for you and for me. Brother Brian, I promise I didn't write this after you introduced the, the subject tonight. I said, please note, Jesus stood between two worlds, between heaven and earth, deity and humanity, and his body, his life was the king. Hallelujah. Now, you may be seated. I'm trying to do everything I can to finish at 8.30, but I need about three or four more minutes. When his flesh was broken, hear me, and this is a huge key here for closing, but when his flesh was broken, and the key is he submitted to God's purpose and never let his journey, his walk, or his suffering to be handled anywhere outside of God's purpose and will. All of the brokenness was submitted, not my will, but thine be done and when his flesh was broken the veil was broken and the channel was made it'll still cost you and I to navigate this channel but the only way we even can cross that channel is because of the price we paid now hear me for three or four minutes dear child of God Hear me, families in this church. Hear me, ministry in this church. And hear me, my friends. I've talked about the Panama Canal. And I've talked about what Jesus did for us. But I want to take a few moments and consider you and I. And I want to look precious people in the eyes and say, do not discount. Let me just take, let me just stop for a moment. Are we okay with three or four more minutes? Are y'all okay? Can we just close our eyes and lift our hands for one moment before we close tonight? The presence of the Lord is so strong. The presence of the Lord is so sweet. Just lift your hands to the Lord right now. Submit your life to him, your ministry to him. You say, well, I'm not called to full-time ministry like Brother Byers or to the missions field. But when you get in the kingdom of God, you have a call on your life. Every one of you, every young person, every couple, every family, I believe that. You are that isthmus. You are that nexus. You are that place of crossing that people can find the kingdom and find Jesus in ministry. Hallelujah. So hear me tonight. I want to talk to you for a moment. Hear me, every young person, every young adult, every family, every person in this room. Do not discount the pain and the suffering that you have walked through. I know this may seem like a little shift. But do not allow the enemy to discount or try to discredit you because of any pain or suffering or brokenness that if you have walked through. Because instead of disqualifying you to be used by God, it qualifies you to be used by God. That brokenness or that divorce or that pain or that misery that you want to say, that was just a bad season. That was terrible. This is my good stuff, but don't look at my bad stuff. And God is saying, if you only knew... That's what qualifies you to be a channel for the Holy Ghost to flow through. Don't discredit your pain. Don't discredit your failure. Don't discredit the struggle. Don't discredit the brokenness. Don't discredit the hell that you may have gone through or the challenge that you may have gone through because all God's doing, he's got a chisel out. All he's doing is he's saying, I am carving a channel that my healing can flow through. If you'll put this pain on my altar, if you'll put this hurt in my hands, it'll become a channel that healing oil will flow through. Keep putting your pain on the altar. Keep putting your hurts on the altar. Keep putting it in God's hands. You're going to realize, you're going to realize God's going to use it so others can find healing, so others can find hope. 
So I say give it to God and watch God use it for his glory. I very rarely mention specifics from my life and family. But I felt to tonight. I wanted you to know the origins of the sermon, the message you just heard. Because this message was born out of a simple prayer that I've prayed. You can stand. I'm, I'm closing. Over the last year, Sister Melinda, it came from my heart. You know what the simple prayer was? God, and this ain't about me, but it's my life. God, would you use this pain to somehow carve a channel so somebody else can find healing or hope? The pain was so deep. I kept praying that little simple prayer, and the Lord led me to study the Panama Canal. Could you use this pain, this trial? Could you use it to carve a channel? I wouldn't have chose in 17 to be afflicted with West Nile virus. Life or death in the hospital for three months. My kids not knowing if daddy was coming home and my wife being super mom, our superwoman. And then I'm recovering. I'm walking again. Three months of therapy to learn to walk again and drive. And our superwoman has a full on emotional and mental breakdown. Ten months of extreme trauma in the home. Ever prayer of faith ever prayer of belief that you could possibly pray this love Jesus but this was broken a bridge and a fall and a life ended three beautiful kids I don't have all the answers pastor I hope it's okay I don't even say these words much but I felt to today but a broken man and again it's not about me but a broken man knows no other thing than to bring me to him and in my brokenness could you use this hurt could you use this journey and it gives me hope that God could use the journey that somebody else Sister Lacey might can save five months and 8,000 miles to find some healing in their life if they can say well he's still serving Jesus our dear brother Denny Jenkins gave me a word a, a few months ago and he said one day in this between God and God will take care of the results but he said one day you're not going to be known because of what happened to you. I just feel to come stand by you, my brother. God's got something for you tonight. But he said, one day, you're not going to be known because of what happened to you. But you're going to be known because of what God does through you. Because of what happened to you. And I have held on to that word. Amen. Amen. That's between God and how he works. <laughs> but Brother Byers, one day, I'm going to be able to stand beside folks in eternity that said, you know, I got healing that flowed through that brokenness. You told me on the phone a few weeks ago. 20 years ago you went on a trip to an Asian based country I don't know what all's happened in that 20 years but I can just tell you I imagine God said a whole lot let me break this flesh let me work on this flesh keep trusting me but now you get to go to a country and be a nexus and be a channel through an isthmus that people can find healing and hope and life and life
life. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now all across this room? I'm going to say it again. Don't, don't discredit that divorce you went through. Don't discredit that brokenness. Don't discredit maybe it was a bankruptcy maybe it was failure in business or life or, or hurt or wounds or brokenness and I want to hide that in the closet I, that that disqualifies me that's what the devil says not God not God God says if you'll put that in my hands uh, if you'll put that on my altar if you'll put that in my presence uh, it becomes a channel that hundreds and millions thousands can find Jesus would you close your hands would you lift your hands to the Lord if you're comfortable taking the hand of the one beside you would you lift it to the Lord right now hallelujah the Panama Canal effect says God will take everything you've been through and use it for his glory the Panama Canal effect says God will take everything you may face Because of what Jesus' flesh went through, the veil was opened. I prophesy over somebody tonight. Because of what you've gone through, somebody's veil is going to be opened. Somebody's journey is going to, because of what you endured, because of what you were faithful in, because of how you kept serving God, somebody's veil is going to open. Somebody's pathway is going to be made clear. Cry out to the Lord for a few moments more Don't discredit your pain. Don't discredit your brokenness. It was in Jesus' flesh when it broke. The veil was open. And your flesh may be being broken. Before you. 